others, and we just pray that you'll be with them. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, and as we come to the end of a study of the Old Testament in this survey, Father, we pray that we'll be reminded of those great truths that are contained in your word. And Father, we're, we're so thankful that as the Apostle Paul said, these things were written for our learning. And, and Father, we pray that we'll learn these rich and glorious lessons. And Father, as we move into the New Testament and we see the fruition of your plan, Father, we see how that uh, for 4,000 years you worked in the lives of men and women and you brought your Son and our Savior. And Father, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to leave the glories of heaven, that he was willing to come and walk among mankind. And Father, that he lived that sinless life, that he left that example before us, that we might walk in his steps. And Father, we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. All right, so we're looking at Malachi chapter 4 this morning as uh, a winding down of the Old Testament. And you remember last week we talked about the work of the prophets. And uh, you can read in 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 9, where before the prophets were referred to as seers, S-E-E-R, seers. They, they, they saw uh, those visions that God gave them and related them to mankind. But about the time of Samuel, there's a change and they become prophets instead of seers. And uh, those words uh, basically cover the same idea. There's a little bit of a distinction. Um, the seer, if you look at it, uh, he would be one that would see the future and tell the people about future events, where the prophet, and the, the word prophet means spokesman. And the prophets, they moved into more being the ones that spoke for God. See, they would approach a seer and ask him a question. And he would tell them what God's plan, God's will was. But the prophet, they didn't necessarily have to approach him and ask. He would actually speak for God and reveal to the people what God. And Samuel is considered the first of the Old Testament prophets. Even though Moses was a prophet, I understand that. But uh, this is where, where we come in and we see Samuel really uh, shining as a prophet of God for the children of Israel. He functioned as a prophet. He functioned as a priest. And that's a very unusual thing. And so Samuel was a great man of God. And we appreciate him. But now we move to that time where God is, is winding down with the prophets. And he sends Malachi. And as we talked about uh, before, the name Malachi is from the Hebrew word malak, which means messenger. And so Malachi, his name is the messenger of God. The messenger of God. That's a literal uh, understanding of his name. He is God's messenger. But in the context of Malachi, I think we can look at it like this and, and, and not do any damage to the, 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 the idea. He is the final messenger of the Old Testament. He's the last one. He is the last messenger of God to the children of Israel. And so he tells them in chapter 4, in verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5, and this is the prophetic statement that he makes to conclude the book. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So as Malachi ends his message to the people of God, remember Malachi is post-Babylonian um, captivity. They've come into the land they have rebuilt the temple of God. Zerubbabel was the main character in the building of the temple of God. And so they actually call this temple Zerubbabel's temple. But I've got a comparison chart up here that I, that I want to talk about for just a moment. Uh, Solomon built the temple 
And of course, when Babylon came in, they, they, they tore it down to the ground. And then Zerubbabel and the children of Israel rebuilt the temple. And you remember as they were rebuilding the temple when they came to dedicate it, do you remember that uh, the people were rejoicing? But what were some of the older folks doing when they saw that temple of Zerubbabel's? Do you remember? They were weeping. And why were they weeping? It, it didn't compare to the temple that Solomon had built. Uh, it, it was just non-comparison. And so then Herod comes along, and you remember who Herod is. He was uh, 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 not of the Jewish lineage. He, he, I say that. He was, but it was uh, more of the Judean lineage instead of the uh, nation of Israel. And uh, he was placed there by the Roman Caesars. He, he was a usurper by, in that sense, to the throne, in order to, to curry favor with the Jewish people, he remodels Zerubbabel's temple. And if you, if you can see this scale, you've got down here a football field above that. Whoop, did I do that? <laughs> you've got a football field, and then above that, you've got Herod's temple, and then beside, uh, just above that, you've got the size of Solomon's temple. So Solomon's temple was a little bit smaller than a football field, but Herod, trying to uh, really curry favor with the Jews, he remodels that temple of Zerubbabel, and he greatly expanded, expanded it. It's almost twice the original size of what Solomon had be, built. It's over twice the size of what Zerubbabel built, but he's doing that to curry favor with the Jewish people. And so God, in sending Malachi, says, I want you to remember the law of Moses. That's verse 4. And uh, the, the commandments that I gave in Horeb, and you remember the statutes and judgment. And then he said, I'm going to send another prophet. And in this, it calls him Elijah. Of course, Jesus would remind us he came in the spirit. What does it mean he came in the spirit of Elijah? What would that word spirit, the spirit of Elijah, what is he talking about? Similar, same, uh, same attitudes that Elijah, and you remember Elijah was not uh, a weak prophet of God. Remember, he would confront the prophets of Baal uh, on uh, Mount Carmel and mock them and ridicule them because their false god would not answer them. And so Elijah was that, that powerful prophet of God uh, that actually followed after uh, Samuel. And so he's going to come in the likeness of Elijah. So let's talk about this gap. When God ended Malachi, and we mentioned this last week, he said, I'm not going to say another word for 400 years. And David pointed this out to me. We, we talked about the significance of that. Not going to say another word. And he didn't even tell them how long it was going to be. He just told them in his last message, there's going to be a new prophet coming, and he's going to come like Elijah. So for 400 years, they've looked for this prophet that would come in the spirit of Elijah. 400 years, I'm not going to say a word. And David pointed out to me, it's been nearly 2,000 years since he said a word to us. Think about that. Think about that. I'm not going to tell you one more thing. And these people that want to plea for modern revelation, I want God to speak to me and God to tell me this and God to tell me that. It's, it's in vain. We go to his word, and he's told us everything that he's going to tell us. And you remember in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So he's not saying another word. Jim? Don't he come to us in prayer? In prayer? But he doesn't talk to us and tell us things. But yeah, I mean, as we talked about last Sunday uh, or no, it was two Sundays ago in our singing from the book of Hebrews chapter 13 or chapter 2 it is, Jesus is here with us when we're worshiping God. 
But he's not speaking to us and giving us new revelation. Uh, so, yes, he's there when we pray. He's there when we worship. He's there in our life. But he's not going to tell us anything new. Yes, sir. He's not telling us anything new, but every time we read the Bible, he's speaking to us. That's, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's not that he's not talking to us. It's, he's talking to us if we're willing to pick up that Bible. Yes, yes. And when I meant talking, he's not telling us anything new. He's not speaking in our ears. We go to his word, and his word is how he speaks to us. That's exactly right. And that's what Hebrews 1, in verse number 1, God used to speak to the prophets, to, or to the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, he says he's spoken unto us by his son. And so we go to his word. That's exactly right. So let's just take a few moments, and I'm not going to do a, um, a big... Uh, study on the, the time between the Testaments, but during that time, a lot of things happen. When we close out the Old Testament, you remember that Babylon had come in and conquered the nation of Israel, and God had said, you need to be looking for that Messiah that's going to come, and remember we talked about the prophecies of Him building the house of God, establishing the kingdom of God, and... Uh, so during this time, scholars, and, and I'm not sure that I agree with them 100% on this, uh, assume that the synagogues came into play during this 400-year period of silence. I think there's uh, some biblical evidence that, that in the uh, rebuilding of the temple and the reestablishment of the Jews into the promised land, they probably started building synagogues during that time, but definitely during this time of silence, the, the synagogue uh, became a very prominent thing. And what is a synagogue? Okay, it's a building for what? Okay, it's, it's a building to worship God. And so the Jews would come on every Sabbath day and they would gather together and they would read the law and they would worship God uh, as we do. On the, and there's a lot, of, a lot of similarities to what the Jews did and what we do on the Lord's Day. They would come together, they would sing, they would pray, they would uh, read the scripture, they would give of their means. Of course, they didn't partake of the Lord's Supper because Jesus had not come yet, but... Uh, they would offer sacrifices uh, depending on the time of the year. And so the synagogues become very prominent during this time. And uh, as the Babylonians are conquered by the Medes and the Persians, and then, of course, the Greeks come in, and then the Greeks are defeated by the Roman Empire, all of this transpires at the end of the Old Testament during this 400-year period of silence. It all culminates at that point. Of course, at the time that Jesus is born, we all know this, the Roman government controls the majority of the world. They very definitely control the nation of Israel. And remember from Daniel 2 and verse 44, God had told them that it was during the time of the Roman kings that he was going to build this house. He's going to send the Messiah to build the house. So when those Roman authorities, uh, when Rome comes to power and conquers the world, then the Jews knew from Daniel, from Jeremiah, from even Malachi, Ezekiel, they knew that they were living in the time that the Messiah was going to come. So what are they looking for at this point? Okay, they're, they're looking for an earthly Messiah, but, but they're looking for the prophet Elijah, the one who's going to come in the spirit of Elijah, who's going to pave the way for the coming of the Messiah. So, so God had told them, and they were expecting this Messiah to come at any moment. And by the way, think about the correlation for us today. Jesus made us a promise. He's coming again. We don't know when. But no, we know he's coming back. So we wait in anticipation for that moment. But Jesus is born during the time of the uh, Roman kings. The entirety of the Old Testament is finished with the book of Malachi. It, it is now a complete 
set for the Jews to have, going back to what Larry was talking about. God was not directly speaking to them, but he was still speaking through his word. Remember Malachi 4 and verse 4. As he, he concludes, he said, Now you remember the law that Moses gave. You remember those commandments and judgments. So God closes out all the Old Testament books. And I've talked about this before, and uh, you know this. Uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish, their Bible is, it doesn't contain 39 books. I don't remember the exact number. I've looked at it, but it doesn't contain 39 books. And you say, well, do we have what they have? We have exactly what they have. But they have 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. They're all one book. First and second chronicles, one book. And uh, as we've talked about on other occasions, the only reason those were divided the way they are, first Samuel, second Samuel, is because the scrolls that they wrote on were too the, the, the books were too large for their scrolls. So they actually broke them into first, second Samuel, first and second Kings, and first and second chronicles to shorten the scrolls, and that's why we have it listed as we have it listed. It's the same books. They just look at it differently. By the way, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings in the Jewish Bible is called First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kings. They break it down like that. So it's it, it's all the First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings. That's all the book of the kings of Israel. And then you've got First and Second Chronicles, which is kind of a restatement of some of the things in those other books. But uh, in First Chronicles, is it the first sixteen chapters? He does the genealogies, and uh, and he does that. He records that. And and by the way, this is toward the same time as the writing of Malachi. Why would he record all the genealogies before he stops talking to them? Why would God want those chronologies written down? How are they going to worship God if they don't know who the Levites are? You've got to have the Levites. You've got to have the descendants of Aaron. And so we look at 1 Chronicles, the first 16 or 19 chapters, whatever it is, and, and see all those chronologies, and we're like, I ain't reading that. That's exactly right. So, so those chronologies were very important. Now, do we have to know them and memorize them? No, because <laughs> it, it, you know. But there are important chronologies that we need to know. We need to know about the descendants of Aaron. We need to know about the descendants of Levi. We need to know about Judah because Jesus is coming from the tribe of Judah, and so those genealogies had to be written down by inspiration and then they were kept in the temple complex they they stored them in the temple complex and when a new child was born they would actually go and they would add that child's name to those roles so that they could know where you came from could you be one of the Jew, uh, one of the uh, priests well you had to trace your lineage back to Aaron could you be one of the, the, the servants in the temple where you had to trace your lineage back to Levi? If you're going to be of the tribe of Judah, you need to know those things. And uh, like we said, we don't put a lot of stock, and I say we in a kind of an American terminology, we don't normally put a lot of stock in the genealogies, although it's, it's kind of grown popular the last 30 years or so, and yeah, I, I can trace it all the way back. We came on the Mayflower, you know. <laughs> I'm not saying we did. I'm saying people say that. Uh, and, and, you know, so genealogies uh, are gaining in prominence in America. Uh, but to the Jews, it was everything. You had to know your genealogy. So God completes all the Old Testament books, including those genealogies that are going to be so important as the New Testament arrives, because if we didn't have the genealogies, we could not prove that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So there had to be an inspired record of the genealogies. And 
Not only that, and y'all know this, the Septuagint was translated during this time. Now the Septuagint, and I'm not trying to, uh, I'm just telling you historical facts. The Septuagint, in Greek, Septuagint means 70. So there were 70 scholars that took the Hebrew uh, Old Testament and they translated it into the Greek language. And that's the Septuagint. So when you read the quotes, many times the writers of the New Testament and the speakers of the New Testament, they're actually quoting from the Septuagint. And you can see that and because uh, you know this, but from taking from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, it, the phrases, it might take, uh, for instance, uh, in, in, a, in a Greek text, it might be 17 words, and in a Hebrew text, it might be six. And so the, the words, you can read the New Testament writers and speakers, and you can tell they're not going all the way back to the Hebrew. They're quoting from the Septuagint. And so the Septuagint was translated at this time. What's the significance of that? Why is that important? Why, what was one of the accusations that you see scholars today make about Jesus and the apostles? What is one of their arguments to try to disprove the Bible? They will say that Jesus and the apostles actually manipulated the Old Testament text to make it fit Jesus. They will say, look, he didn't really do all those things, and those prophecies in the Old Testament really weren't what they said. So Jesus and his apostles, they tampered with the text to make it seem like Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, that's what modern-day scholars are telling people. And if you don't believe that, listen to some of those... Uh, uh, debates uh, that are going on on college campuses right now. And if you listen to some of those, if you listen to guys like um, Ben Shapiro and some of those guys, they appear on college campuses uh, across the, the, the United States and they're met with protest and uh, ugly things. But if you listen to the, when they have their question and answer sessions, if you listen to what these students are saying, and sometimes it's even the professors in the schools, in the colleges that are, that are attacked, what they talk about is that the Bible has been changed and manipulated, and the words that we read right now, they say, were not what those Old Testament people read or what those New Testament, they say it's been corrupted. By the way, that's what Islam says. If you didn't know, you know, uh, Jesus is mentioned more in the Quran than Muhammad. Muhammad's mentioned four times. I think Jesus is at like 23 times that they mention Jesus. But they say he's not the Jesus that you think. Those things about Jesus, well, they've been corrupted. He's not the Son of God, they say. He's a man, a great man. Oh, they say he's one of the greatest prophets that ever was. But they say he was just a man. So don't sit back and think that's not going on right now in the United States. And it's fiercely debated on college campuses right now. Any of them, even the major ones that started out as religious schools like Harvard and Yale started out we need to train our young people in the Word of God. They need to know the Bible. And they started out as religious training institutions, and now they are so far gone away from that that it's not even... It, it, you would, it, the founders of Harvard would probably burn that building down today and say, I wish I'd never built it. They would not recognize it. They would be in complete shock, I believe. So anyway, the Septuagint was translated during this time. So that leads us to this point. The Savior's coming. And we come to the book of the New Testament. Look in Luke 
chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Before I leave uh, that time between the Testaments, is there any questions that anybody has? Yes, ma'am. Yes, the males were commanded to go to Jerusalem to the temple three times a year, yes. And that's what I was talking about a moment ago, and I wasn't very clear, I don't guess. But uh, they would even sometimes offer like thanksgiving sacrifices and wave offerings. They would do that in the synagogue. But three times a year, the male had to go to Jerusalem to worship God Passover, uh, the Feast of Booths, and the last one, it slipped my mind. There were three, three feasts that they had to, the males had to go. Of course, as we've talked about, it became common that when they would go, it was the entire family would go. And that goes back to the days of Samuel. You remember Elkanah and Hannah, Samuel's parents, they went to the temple every year to go to these different, and, and they would go as a family. And you remember El, Elkanah had two wives, Panini and Hannah, and they, they and all their kids would go together as a family unit, and that's in the days of the judges. And so it continued on, and so they would go as family units, uh, not every time, but the males were commanded three times a year. Yes, sir. Uh, that was a Roman thing. That's when we read to the New Testament where, where uh, uh, Herod had called this tax. They would go to their hometown. They wouldn't go to Jerusalem. They'd go to their hometown, and there would be a reckoning. And that's why uh, Joseph and Mary are in the city of David or the city of Bethlehem when Jesus is born because it was that time of taxing. So they would come. It would be like, and of course couldn't do it, uh, but... If, if on our tax day on April the 15th, we would all have to go to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that? So that's another, that was a Jewish, th I mean a, a Roman thing and not, not as a part of the Old Testament law. All right, anything else? So let's go to chapter 2 of the book of Luke. The Savior that they've been looking for is now here. And that's what we read in Luke chapter 2 and others as well. But it says in Luke 2 and verse number 1, there came to pass, or it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So that's what you're talking about, Jim. Uh, and notice that it came from Caesar and not from the Old Testament. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And if I understand that right, it's the city of your ancestors. So Bethlehem being the city of David is where uh, Jer Mary and Joseph are going to go. So it says, uh, and uh, they all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. Verse 4, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of the house and lineage of David. So there's, there's how we know that uh, Jesus is going to come from the right lineage. David is of the tribe of Judah. And so that's how we know these things, and they were recorded by inspiration. And if you want some spare reading, just go read First Chronicles about 19 chapters, and you'll pull your hair out when you do because it's begetting and begotten and all these things and and uh, we look at it and say I don't need to know all of that well we have to have it for our uh, proof of who Jesus is so Joseph is going back out of Nazareth to the city of Bethlehem to be taxed verse 5 with Mary his espoused wife being great with child. By the way, Mary uh, is also of the lineage of David, and uh, that's important as well uh, because um, 
if Joseph were of the lineage of David and Mary were from another tribe, then Jesus wouldn't be from the right tribe. It had to be Mary that had to be from the right tribe. That's why we have both genealogies recorded. We've got Joseph and Mary's genealogies recorded. Both of them can be traced back to David. And so uh, since uh, we know and they did not know that Joseph was not actually Jesus' father, then they would have brought that up. Wait a minute. Your daddy's not of the tribe of Judah. You can't be the Messiah. But we know that he was. So in their perspective, he would have fit as being the Messiah. Of course, as we said, they didn't understand that Jesus was actually the Son of God. So uh, they didn't understand it at first. Let me say it this way. So she's great with child, verse 5. And so it was that while they were there, verse 6, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Notice that firstborn son. The implication of that is she's going to have more children. Uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary is false. It's false. It's the figment of their imagination. Uh, but they teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She never had a relationship with Joseph. She only had that relationship through the Holy Spirit and God as the father of Jesus. And she never knew a man according to uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine. They're just wrong. They're just wrong. Uh, they had multiple children after Jesus was born. But Jesus is the firstborn. Why, what is the significance of the firstborn? He's the one in line to be the next ruler of the family. So he's the firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Notice that, to all people, not just the Jews, but to all people. Verse 11, For unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. By the way, the shepherds found Jesus in the manger. The wise men came about two years later and Jesus was in a house. So what does that do to the manger scenes that we see all over? You know, we keep the manger in Athens and we got the wise men there and the wise men weren't there. <laughs> the shepherds were there. But uh, that's what you see and that's why we, 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 we go to the Bible and check everything against the Word of God. And so uh, the, the wise men did not come to the manger. The shepherds did. Anyway, verse 13. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and good will toward men. So uh, the announcement, the pronouncement in the beginning of the New Testament to the people of God and ultimately to the entire world, that Messiah is here. So guess what we're going to talk about next week? We enter the last days. This is the last days. So we've got the survey of the Old Testament done. We've talked about the between the Testament. Now we're going to talk about the Christian dispensation. And again, it'll be in the form of a survey. Any questions or comments? All right, thank y'all. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. Satan does not want us to know. Seeds full of doubt is what he sows. 
He is the adversary. Call on the name of Jesus. Follow the way that Jesus shows. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. People will say you cannot know. That is just disbelief they show. I believe Jesus when he tells us that we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. God, he has told us in his word that he has given us a sword. With it expose the arrows, cut fables with a fervor, point to his unity, the Lord. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is, the devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his, the truth is his.